Whereas the way I'm thinking about our future is uh, uh, right now we have 300 circles and just imagine Zappos is a circle printing factory and we take people that get recruited into Zappos, give them the uh, right training and coaching and so on so that they can either join an existing circle or start their own circle and do that intersection between you know, what they're passionate about, what they're good at, and then uh, you're going to be that much uh, closer to I don't know, figuring out something magical. Remember a time when you could just go out and eat at a restaurant inside the actual restaurant where you could talk to people without having to worry about wearing a mask. And uh, that that's actually when our our podcast with Tony Shea, Tyler Williams, and Jen Taller took place down at Ferguson's downtown in Vegas. And look, when a guest tells you to, to go, you, you get on a plane and you go. And that's kind of what happened a few months back before COVID. Uh, and John, our producer and I, we actually stayed at Ferguson's downtown. Yeah, really cool episode. And we got to hear from Tony about how he structured Zappos and the circles and how they operate the business and that you can join a circle and, and really they're meant to set up an intersection between what you're passionate about and what you're good at. But the more interesting thing is that you guys got to stay in the environment, a city block rooted in community. And, and John, I think you, you met a special friend while you were doing this with Berman, right? Yeah. Ferguson's downtown is unlike any place I've ever been. It's a community. It's got a bunch of airstreams, a bunch of tiny homes, and they have their own alpaca that walks around Marley, and he's part of the the gang. And we had a really good time over there. I, I was one of the best uh, one of the best experiences I can remember. And you know what? It, it felt like clean, like a clean Burning Man for entrepreneurs. And this is just it's Tony Shea esque. It's very intentional. Um, he's like creating these environments where collisions can happen from really smart people and that magic is coming out of the collisions and if, if you've studied Tony those circles that Ryan you were talking about and he, he wrote a whole book I think holacracy is what it's called about how you know people do best when they get to decide what they're working on and so very thoughtful very intentional and we cover it all here on the podcast also uh, Tyler Williams did have one of the coolest um, uh, titles we we heard, which was what was it again, Ryan? Fungineer. Fungineer. So yeah, this is Zappos at its finest. We also Thompson and I also had a chance to tour Zappos and just to see how intentional of a setup the building actually is. And uh, if you're really into like thoughtful systems that inspire workforces, this is the podcast to listen to. We, I was sitting in here all by myself um, at Ferguson's downtown, and I read your whiteboard. It says, neighborhood market square rooted in community, celebrating music, art, nature, and local creators. And just, you know, thought that was really interesting, not only from the fact that you guys are moving to um, a community culture, and, and we'll talk more about kind of your background, and, and Tony, how you've created this value system but maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the space that we're sitting in to start with. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, there's six of us here. And uh, so me, I'm Tony, uh, CEO of Zappos, and also uh, helped start Downtown Project, which is all about helping revitalize Downtown Vegas. And then we've got... I'm Tyler, I'm lead link of Brand Aura at Zappos, and my title there is The Fungineer. And who gave you that title? Uh, actually, the employees started kind of giving me that title over time. So I started working on a lot of like unique projects and people just started calling me the Fungineer. So we eventually created a, a position called Fungineer. And what's your purpose statement? The purpose of Brand Aura is Zappos universally known as fun, unique, a little irreverent, uh, to be community employee and customer obsessed. And our ultimate goal is to make everybody say, wow. So and that, that rolls up to the overall uh, purpose of Zappos, which is to live and deliver well. Which I believe is the number one on the, on the, the every employee has a key card. Mm -hmm. Deliver well through service is the number one. Yeah, our core values are on our, our 
our badge that allows us access to the company and our number one core value, which they're all equally important, but the first one is deliver wow through service. Now and there's then, a, oh, sorry. No, go for it. Oh, I was uh, just going to say to <laughs> my, a third. To yeah, my, that's what I was trying to do. The silent. <laughs> Yeah. Well, she's only silent right now, not in real life. <laughs> but this is Jen, who used to work at Zappos, but now oversees Ferguson's downtown, so she can best answer. Yeah, I can let you know where you're hanging out. Cool. So uh, Ferguson's downtown uh, started a couple years back, actually. There's a bunch of us, um, primarily Tony and a few others, that lived in Airstreams and Tiny Houses uh, on a lot across from Ferguson's, probably four years ago, I think it was. Um, and there, there's a few of us that would come for winter camp, so for two months out of the year, hang out, stay, which I think was a whole ruse to eventually get us all to live here, because after <laughs> every winter camp, more of us never left, uh, to where we are today, which we moved the property across street to Ferguson's downtown, which is an old motel. It was built in the 40s, named Franklin's Motel. In the 60s, it was transitioned to Ferguson's. Uh, so we actually put uh, the 32 units that were across street on this property in the back. Uh, currently, you're in the section that there's 15 Airstreams and tiny houses, uh, seven apartment units upstairs, and about 30 of us that live here full time, 12 dogs, an alpaca, six cats, maybe a sloth. This is the first time I've been here. So look, this is this is like burning man without the dust. Okay, this is, there's like sprinkles of Coachella all over the place. And then the, and then you get to feed a, a llama when, as like a ritual when you walk in here. And so I, I don't know if people have the opportunity to come visit the property or do you call it a property? What do we, what do you call it? So no, it's private residential. So if someone does want to give a tour, they can reach out to info at Ferguson's Uh, and as long as there's availability and we can accommodate the tour time, we'd be more than happy to bring people back here. Uh, again, we just have to remind people when you open that gate, it's like you open the front door to someone's house. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and again, this I'm not surprised, frankly, that this has been designed by the team that designed Zappos, frankly, because you seem to always be a step ahead of what most other people are doing. And, you know, look, as a guy that wrote a book about courage, and I say if you're having a conversation about courage, you're really having a conversation about change. And so the one conversation the viewers should know before we started rolling was, like, Am I actually in the future right now? Is this what the, like, if you had your way, would there be little pockets like this in other parts of the country? Is that what success kind of looks like? Or are you just super focused right now on, like, really turning downtown Vegas around? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a uh, chime in on that is, you know, being a Las Vegas resident, I didn't live here my whole life, but I've been here about 13 years. Uh, and i also been in the music scene. Downtown Las Vegas was a really... Um, quite frankly, dangerous part of our community. And, um, you know, where we're at is east from Las Vegas Boulevard. We're on 11th Street. Um, and there was a time where I wouldn't even, as a six foot one bearded guy, walk <laughs> across 7th Street and continue on down the street. So I think what's what I've seen happen over the years with, um, with Zappos moving downtown, um, downtown project, and the investments that we've all made into the community is the community overall turnaround. And one thing I've heard Tony say is if we can do it here in Las Vegas, where there was, we basically, the city kind of turned its back on downtown. If we can do it here, hopefully we can inspire the world um, to do it everywhere else. And I already, I already see it happening in other cities. You know, you got Detroit and these other communities that are popping up from quite frankly, what used to be considered a bad area of town and the model, um, I think this was an inspiration to some of that happening. Do you feel like the community is starting to change even more now? I mean, I, I've lived here going on four years now, and just over the last two years, it seems like communities coming back together. Tony, I know you've been working on this space for a long time and been invested here, but what, have you seen anything, any changes recently? Uh, I think we all have uh, both. I think part of it is on the downtown project side. Uh, we invested in uh, either somewhere as investments with other entrepreneurs and some uh, we did with our own staff, but added, uh, we, we call them collisionable spaces, yeah. places where people can run into each other serendipitously. And so that could be a restaurant, a cafe, a bar, uh, 
retail shops, uh, there's Container Park. And so uh, from my perspective, our strategy was let's just create spaces uh, where residents and purposeful visitors can collide. And uh, statistically, the magic will just kind of happen on its own. People will meet each other. And then I think uh, you know, the community aspect of it is... I, I guess I'm more. I've been more focused on uh, the. I know if you want to use analogy, uh, if you think of downtown as the greenhouse, like we've been kind of trying to architect the greenhouse so that it creates the right conditions for people in communities to flourish on their own, and then Jen's been more involved, uh, more directly with the actual uh, creators and so on in the community. Yeah, Tyler, you were saying before before we popped on that you've had 30 maybe business transactions that have come out of those collisionable experiences or transactions, I guess. Yeah, there's a lot of really unique opportunities within both the Airstream Village Fergus residence space and just downtown in general. A 30, I would attribute 30, um, and this is just me kind of guessing based on, you know, in my mind, I, uh, <laughs> is is directly related to being here in the Airstream Village in this community with people coming and visiting and staying here, special events. Where we host jam sessions uh, once a month where we just invite the community to come out and anybody can play instruments and jump up on the stage, which we have a stage uh, um, available with, with instruments available for anybody. So you'll have these monster musicians from the Strip come, but you'll also have some beginners, and it's like this really beautiful mixture um, and then there's a lot of you know uh, corporate events that also happen here uh, called tacos and llamas and mm -hmm. uh, those events are there's always just and you never know who's who's here and uh, being fun engineer at Zappos and working a lot with marketing um, made a lot of a lot of connections that just started with a hey who are you? What's your name? Mm -hmm. And then figuring out what somebody does and where there could be overlaps. Uh, with Zappos has proved to be very fruitful. I think one of the themes that actually Ryan wrote about in the Return on Courage book was the blurred lines between the professional and personal you. And I know, Tony, you talk a lot about that with, at Zappos and that it should feel synonymous, that you should be the same person at home, same person at work. It seems like these type of experiences provide that platform to allow that to happen. Yeah, if you could, we'll see everybody here before we jump in. I mean, pretty much everyone but Thompson, this poor guy's in a suit today. But uh, outside of that, like, everyone else is, like, T-shirts. We've got, looks like, bobbleheads now. Those are the Backstreet Boys on <laughs> the oh, back, do, Zappos the, Theater. Does any of the Backstreet <laughs> Boys <laughs> have anything to say today? No? Well, both Tyler and I worked the merch booth at the Zappos Theater when Backstreet Boys were playing, so we got matching Bats, Backstreet Boys shirts for, for uh, people that listening uh it's not just any backstreet boy shirt there's literally a shirt with i don't know 20 heads of different backstreet boys all over the front and back now does that come in other colors or just in no white? it's just this one and honestly they didn't think this was going to be a good seller but it sells like hotcakes at their <laughs> merch booth and what i love about it is it's just kind of how badly it's done <laughs> yeah. It's blurry pictures from like probably Facebook from way long ago or something, and it just looks terrible. But it gets a lot of comments. <laughs> I mean, clearly, I mean, it seems like we're having fun here. I mean, are we having fun here? I mean, as a group, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's like, Jen, Jen, Jen's like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> come see, come saw. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, not that there's yeah. not a lot of hard work that comes with it, but. Oh, for sure. Oh, just in our ecosystem, not yeah. in this exact moment of the podcast. I'm yeah. Like, <laughs> thriving in this <laughs> moment right now. No, I am. It's really fun. I think, yeah, I think I, what's awesome about Tony, I think as a whole and what he's built within Zappos and downtown and Ferguson's is to really empower people and what they're passionate about and, or maybe what they didn't even know what they could be passionate about, um, construction for myself. <laughs> um, but no, it's been really awesome to be able to feel uh, someone believe in you and also give you the opportunity to make the quote unquote mistakes to learn from and then also do what you're passionate about. For me, I've always been a champion of small businesses and creatives and highlighting and supporting that. So it's been awesome for myself to be able to have that vision alongside with him and 
work on this whole city block and dive deep with our local community and where Tyler talked a lot about the collisions that they've had from like Zappos and Life is Beautiful. That's also true on the smaller scale from smaller businesses. Uh, we host a monthly event called Mark in the Alley, open to the public. It's the third Sunday of the month. And a lot of those makers and creators do a lot of collaborations together and or have had opportunities to do something at Life is Beautiful or do something for Zappos or... Um, different events and different things that come in town. So to be able to take that impact from someone's first passion gig and then create those relationships and partnerships and then also be seen by these uh, bigger corporations or platforms that then appreciate that too is kind of that sliding scale of what we're trying to create here. And then again, another thing to be able to take to other cities to give that opportunity. And I, I mean, that's that's the collisionable right, opportunities. Mm-hmm. Did I get that right? Yeah. Collisionable opportunities. Yeah, and like we have a, a saying at Zappos called return on collisions or return on community. Mm. Instead of ROI, it's, you know, ROC. Mm. Uh, and I, I think have my own ROC. You have your own ROC, which <laughs> yeah. is hmm, ties back to, you know, there's so many different things besides return on your investment, you know, yeah. courage being one of them. So. Yeah. Um, so clearly, like, this is easier here to be yourself. Mm-hmm. Why? Why do you think that's so hard? Like, why why are other cultures getting this part wrong? Or, maybe, or maybe I can ask cuz Tony you started at Oracle and then left, right? Like what was what rubbed you the w- wrong way about corporate culture because I think that kind of led you to this place of empowerment and where you really truly believe that there's a purpose and that mission should be centered around values. Yeah, I, I mean it's not specific to Oracle. I would say most corporations uh you know, hire people based on their skill sets and um, and basically you, you end up being your job description and nothing more. And so uh, I think the way we try to approach things, whether it's at Ferguson's or downtown or, or at Zappos, is we want people to bring their full selves to work and... Um, uh, sometimes refer to it as wholeness and what we found is when if you are able to bring your full self to work your whole self to work then you end up developing better friendships they're not just co-worker relationships but actual friendships and and then you discover all these amazing talents that are normally hidden that uh, employees have and you know most big companies, I would guess, uh, maybe don't see the value of it, whereas our uh, our approach at Zappos is figure out what the employee's passionate about, and then my I, ideal, I guess, vision for uh, employees everywhere, including at Zappos, would be for everyone to find that intersection between what they're good at, what they're passionate about, and what moves the company forward, and so on the Zappos side of things, we're undergoing some changes to allow employees to kind of uh, chart their own path. And I'll give an example. Our head of HR uh, comes from an HR background, and usually an HR job is pretty uh, uh, cookie cutter, uh, but she happens to be passionate about running, and she also happens to be passionate about uh, the Golden Knights hockey team that's new to Las Vegas. And so... Now she's, because we, what well we have, uh, for background, we have roughly about 1,500 employees at Zappos and about 300 circles or teams. We call them circles. Employees can belong to multiple circles. And so uh, Holly's, because of her passion for the local hockey team and for running, she also has uh, started a business that does fun 5K races and then another business within Zappos uh, that does HR as a service, and and she just had a meeting with the Golden Knights yesterday to talk about possibly offering them that service. And so, uh, I, I know her. She she's always been, I think, historically frustrated with the HR world or industry in general. And in fact, prior to Zappos, was even thinking of leaving HR. And uh, her goal is to help change what HR is in the world in general. And so. Now she's able to not just focus on Zappos, but start uh, you know, one company at a time or one organization at a time, and 
hopefully uh, start with the Vegas Golden Knights and then see who else is interested. And then uh, ultimately she can have an impact beyond just Zappos. Yeah, it seems like that gives a platform for courage, I guess, to go out and influence others in the community. And, and that's ultimately, I think, what you're trying to do with Ferguson's as well. Um, I, I read, Tony, that you at Zappos also um, performance reviews are 50% based on whether you're delivering and inspiring the culture. Um, and like what Ryan was saying in the research he did on, on courage, it's, it's really about more about culture and just curious, like, how do you keep it intact? I mean, you, as you grow and you got acquired by or bought by Amazon, but they let you still do your own thing. I mean, it seems like I know you were interviewing like every employee that came into the, to the company, but it seems like one of the hardest things to do is you continue to grow and expand and do new things. I mean, what keeps it all together? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same question as the community question uh, for Jen. Just, I think culture is just what's the community or what type of community do you have within the four walls of a of a company? And so for us uh, at Zappos, we do two sets of interviews. That there's the hiring manager and team does their standard set of interviews, but then our recruiting team does a separate set of interviews purely for culture fit or uh, making sure that the personal values of whoever we're interviewing is in line with the Zappos corporate values. And um, and uh, also employees, even if they're doing their job, specific job function perfectly well, um, if they're doing, if they're bad for our culture, if they're doing stuff that's against our core values, they can be fired for that reason alone. And we also... Yeah, based performance review. It varies by department exactly how they do it, but performance reviews and promotions have a uh, big culture p- component as well. Uh, and then similarly on the Ferguson side, uh, we want to make sure that the people, the residents living here, aren't just thinking of living here as a place to sleep at night. But uh, one of our mantras is to contribute more than you take and. We don't really dictate exactly how. So there are some people that like to cook. There's some people that like to clean. Actually, I don't know if anyone likes to clean. Chris but Chris okay, Chris yes. Yeah. There's some people that like to organize. There's, <laughs> yes, uh, there's some things. people that yeah. like to play music. There's people like Tyler here uh, randomly comes by and grills the most amazing steaks all the time. <laughs> it's my fallback. If things don't work out at Zappos, I'm going to open a steak restaurant <laughs> or be Santa Claus, one of the two. What's your go-to? Uh, my go-to is to do New York's with a Worcestershire sauce and Montreal seasoning, and uh, then just grill it up, and it just, people love it. This is what happens when you marry a pescatarian, by the way. You're all like, what's your go-to? <laughs> Tell me what type of steak you cook. Uh, let me ask this question. I mean, I mean, obviously, this is the courageous podcast, but I sense, like, almost like, <laughs> we talked about ROCs, that there's lots of ROCs, right? There's return on culture. There's... Return on courage. There's a return on community. But I feel like like the biggest thing I sense, and we've known, Tyler and I have known each other now. He let me into his life maybe four years ago. Mm-hmm. Right? You, yeah. let me, you let me come to the office and interview you. And every time I meet somebody from the team, there's like this undertone of curiosity. And, and almost everybody Turn I Turn on curiosity. That's, that's where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, get the URL. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> get the, <laughs> get the URL. Get the return on curiosity.com. <laughs> my second book. But um, do, do you, is that, I mean, I feel like you're very deliberate as a group that way on allowing the, colli- the collisions are really just opportunities for people to be curious. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes back to how Zappos hires, is it's definitely something that we look for in the hiring process. A lot of uh, when I'm hiring for my team, if, whether it's hiring internally at Zappos or hiring externally, um, I rarely ask questions about technical expertise. I asked, I, t- I should just try to find out who the person is. Simple questions like Marvel or DC, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite TV show? Uh, what do you like to do for, uh, you know, to, to relax or, um, you know, things that really make a person who they are and can give you a lot of insight. Um, and you can tell a lot from those questions, uh, how 
curious a person is. And uh, usually when we get done interviewing, the team looks at each other and goes like, is this somebody who we would just hang out with, Mm -hmm. go have a drink with, or um, invite over to the house? And that is a a question we ask on every person that we're bringing into the team. Uh, Curiosity also, I think, comes from being empowered and having the freedom to to um, be curious. I think a lot of a lot of companies actually, I, I believe it's a system problem that shuts down curiosity. Um, and I'd attribute that to you know hierarchy at scale and different things that um, make curiosity a difficult thing to embody. I'm curious, what do you do to break down the bureaucracy in Zappos? It really like stamps on creativity and ideas sometimes because it's so hard to get through. Um, I know you put everybody through the the call center, so they have to be focused on service and have autonomy to make decisions. I think that's huge, but just curious on some of the other ways in which you break down bureaucracy in the company. Yeah, so so most organizations, including Zappos, for the first, uh, call it 15 years, are structured in a hierarchical org chart. And through no fault of any specific individual, the problem is as the organization gets bigger, like bureaucracy just naturally uh, creeps in and uh, it just, there's plenty of research that shows there's less innovation per employee, uh, less productivity and, and so on. And so we made a change, I'm gonna say six or seven years ago, uh, and the first change, so after, I guess, reading up on uh, research on different types of organizations, uh, it seems like the only type of organization that actually really scales well is, uh, this is a technical term, uh, self-organization. So it doesn't just mean uh, just everyone do whatever they want. Uh, it means figure it for us at Zappos, figuring out what are the minimal number of constraints that enable the maximum amount of freedom and, but also the maximum amount of accountability. And so the first move we made was rather than a hierarchy of people where each person can only be in one place on the org chart, we changed it to a hierarchy of teams or circles. And so right now we have about 300 circles in that hierarchy. Uh, but now the last couple years, and we're literally mis- mid-transition uh, this month, uh, is transitioning from a hierarchy of circles to more of a networked org chart. And I think the uh, easiest analogy is if you think about a city, you know, the mayor of a city doesn't actually tell its residents what to do or where to live. Uh, and the people in small businesses and so on, they just kind of self-organize based on uh, opportunities and supply and demand. Uh, I think uh, in Manhattan, there's something like three days of food supply, but there's no central food supplier of, you know, that's controlling anything in Manhattan. It's, uh, and, but it's also, you know, Manhattan never runs out of food and it's a resilient system. A bridge can go out, there can be a natural disaster and uh, yet uh, food uh, consumption and uh, supplying food still happens. And so, that's the path we're going down is basically uh, telling, we actually have something called the triangle of accountability uh, that is uh, true for Zappos overall. And I'll describe what it is. There's three sides of the triangle, which uh, Tyler is pulling out his phone. Is that in my head? I went, ah, oh, yeah. triangle of accountability. <laughs> so the okay. first uh, left side of the triangle, left, what do you call that? The left rit- left angle uh, of the triangle of accountability is about our uh, culture and core values. So whatever you do at Zappos uh, has to be in line with our culture and core values. And then the second side of the triangle is about uh, having a customer-focused mindset. For Zappos, our brand is about customer service and customer experience. So uh, we want that to be true for everyone at Zappos. And then the bottom of the triangle is what we are calling customer-generated budgeting. And basically it just means you need to balance your P&L. You basically can't run out of money, otherwise you won't be in business anymore. Mm -hmm. And so 
within, if you look at the Zappos organization as a whole, we want the entire organization to uh, basically uh, be inside the triangle, uh, check the boxes for those three sides. But we, that's also true for each of the circles or teams within Zappos. And we are basically telling them, as long as you can accomplish those three things, then do whatever, whatever you want. And so that's how Holly, uh, our HR person, started a, it's called Love Hate Running, and started a Love Hate Running <laughs> circle. And then that's how she started in, to experiment with HR as a service. And there's lots of these stories where, uh, for me, it's pretty exciting because you know, in the future, maybe we'll have thousands of circles and they're each just being run by these uh, kind of internal entrepreneurs at Zappos. And, um, and also, it's interesting that you mentioned curiosity because uh, they, it was a few years ago they did a study on what separated the great entrepreneurs from uh, the mediocre ones, and they found that the great ones highly over-indexed for a uh, for a few personality traits. One was that they were comfortable with ambiguity, and second was they uh, had a strong sense of curiosity, and the third one, not as high but still over-indexed, was uh, emotional intelligence. So. Uh, you know, those are things that we've always cared about at Zappos, but now that we're going down this path of having employees be more entrepreneurial, uh, there's even more focus on those three things. If you had to put a percent breakdown on the perfect um, employee group of entrepreneurs to to employees? In terms of the ratio? Yeah, you know, how or, would you? I mean, my hypothesis is that out of any random group of people, whether it's Zappos people or just uh, pick you know, 100 random people off the street, uh, I think that 5 to 10% of people are uh, have that kind of entrepreneurial uh, capability in them, but I would guess that most of them don't even realize they are capable of that because they haven't been put in that environment yet. And so... Uh, you know, kind of like when Jen was talking about construction, I think <laughs> that was probably the last thing she thought she would get into, yes. you know, five years ago or, <laughs> or as a kid growing up. That assumes you grew up. Yes. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so part of it is, from my perspective, is let's put people, uh, give everyone the opportunity to do that. And, and to be clear, we're not trying to say everyone at Zappos needs to be an entrepreneur it's more that on any one of the in, on any team in any one of those circles, you need one, and uh, or at least one, and then um, and we're it would ideally we want teams to be uh, ten or fewer people so that uh, the teams can really gel and be creative and, the, and and then the other thing we want is for the teams to be diverse. But the research has shown that uh, the number one uh, characteristic of uh, high-performing teams within companies, at least, and probably in general, is uh, is the actual, I don't know what you call it, the culture within that team it's, itself, mm -hmm. and uh, how much they trust each other and get along and, and, and so on, and that uh, is the biggest predictor of how well the team will do, uh, even over how high the average IQ is or uh, how much experience or expertise they have. Seems like you're removing a barrier for fear as well by doing that. And like you can fail and learn from that and try new things. Um, just curious on like how much do you talk about that internally? I mean, do you guys test a lot and try new things? I, I've seen some well, of the stuff that you've done, Tyler. Yeah, I mean... It's a lot psychological safety, getting over those fear barriers is definitely real, especially when it comes to change, which I think ties into your, your, um, you know, what you say about return on courage. Um, it is, it's change and courage, uh, having the courage to, to change, uh, as Apos, we are constantly changing and evolving and there is a lot of fear around that. And it takes the employees on a journey that they have to overcome those fears and, um, kind of get out of that mentality of 
the psychological safety. There's no guarantees in any business or, um, but all you can do is try to set yourself up for the most success. You know, what, how many options do you have? How resilient are you? And for us, that comes with um, unlocking the potential of, of people. You said, are we in the future? I think the future uh, is creating a platforms, call them businesses or whatever you like that unlock people's true potential and creativity and innovation because less and less we're going to need um, technical people to do work. We need more creative and innovation um, and providing a platform for that is the future. Uh, so I think um, as hard as it is to go through these evolutions at Zappos, I look around and I see people um, setting themselves up for future success. I think discipline is another, like it's almost like the opposite in some ways. Like curiosity is a leaning forward on like, well, what else could, what could our future look like? But where have you seen an opportunity in Zappos and anyone, anyone can answer this by the way, where you're like, no, it's not time to lean forward. Actually, it, it's, it's time to hold firm and be disciplined about are you happy? Are you at peace with Zappos at this particular moment? Maybe this is for Tony. Or do you sense, like, are you working on your what's next for Zappos? Uh, I guess for me, it's uh, my, my focus is a little meta. I, I'm, I'm, I'm been working with a team that's been over the last two years, basically creating various tools. We have something called the CFO tool, for example, to, basically enable and empower all these circles to uh, run their own businesses and and for us to get out of the way. And so one ana analogy might be uh, if you look at a city, um, you know, the city needs basic infrastructure like sewage and water and electricity, and those are typically laid out in a city grid. and. Uh, but once that grid is laid out, then magical things happen from the creativity of the residents and small businesses that you know, lay on top of the grid. So uh, my work over the last few years has been mostly focused on how do you build that equivalent of a grid so that uh, all these great ideas have an opportunity to flourish. And I'll actually chime in as somebody who's worked with Tony for several years now and observed him as a CEO is he's not your typical CEO by any means. Uh, I'd say most of your CEOs are, um, if you were to think of a greenhouse, um, maybe the tallest, strongest plant in the greenhouse that all the other plants aspire to be. Um, and more what you describe him as is more of the greenhouse builder, which is trying to get all the plants to be the best that they can be. So, even, you know, a lot, of, a lot of companies are tied to a very eccentric, um, you know, powerful CEO on some level. And actually, that makes the company less resilient. If you think about mm -hmm. it, if anything happens with that CEO from a, um, you know, scandal standpoint or you name it, um, the companies can take a real hit. So I think um, where I've observed uh, Tony's focus is more how... How is the how can we make Zappos not dependent upon mm -hmm. him as a CEO and less on the company leadership? And how do you flip the business on its head so that the customer facing employees are empowered to serve the customer? And what you would consider leadership is now the servants within the organization trying to help them do the best they can. Are you finding that to be really attractive with the newer generation of the workforce? Or are you getting a lot of attention from, you know, people graduating that want to come to Zappos because of that philosophy? Well, in our new hire training uh, classes, when uh, Tony does a Q&A with them, there's a lot of um, super amount of interest, especially in the self-organization and um, customer-generated budgeting, triangle of accountability conversation, because I think it's something that nobody has has or at least that that we know of, nobody has really done before. So um, I personally do see the younger generation very interested in um, how, I guess the way I've heard it explained is instead of organizing people around work, how do you organize work around the people? Mm. And that's, that's nice. it around, right? Yeah. And then if 
you look at it from maybe like a clean slate with DTP and even Ferguson's, I think the idea and concept and vision for the future of Zappos is definitely something happening within our ecosystem. So even though Tony is the visionary and money behind DTP, it's a own ecosystem, self-organized and working on its own. And then that's almost done in a more deeper level here at Ferguson's um, where the community works together on a lot of things here in our physical home, uh, along with the community that we work with. Our whole team is all independent contractors uh, just doing what we're most passionate about. And then how do you support that through that ecosystem and create roles and bounties and different things so that, again, they can focus on the things that they're passionate about rather than here's the work and making it work around that. So, Jen, I mean, you're kind of, a, you know, I, if I'm fluent in anything, it's, it's I think it's a subtext a little bit. So what I love about the circles is, like, if you really are passionate about something, you can, like, lean into it. There's budget to do it. You go and start your thing. But I'm sensing that wasn't how this started for you. Like, for this particular project, like, it sounds like Tony saw something in, in you to run with this thing. So give me a little bit of, like, what were you doing before? I mean, which I know you are at Zappos, and then this opportunity – Comes to you, correct? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I started at Zappos 10 years ago. And I think uh, just having that baseline of like a true real job out of college. And I think that the values of, you know, friends that you work with and those relationships. Like I remember filling out my Zappos form and asked like, what's your favorite, you know, DC character or <laughs> what do you have a nickname? And I remember my family being like, I you need to be, it needs to be more serious. I'm like, no, Huggles is my nickname. And I think, <laughs> I think that got me the job, to be honest, you know? Um, so it was kind of cool to see that quick shift there. Of like, don't have to be all proper and tight up, which helps break the barriers of being more vulnerable and true to who you are. And then even working within the ecosystem of don't be afraid of your directors and they're not being offices and they're at the front of the row. So whenever you're at that point, we're walking around the campus, you're immediately always like, hi, X person, X person, who's the lead of that team. Um, and then with Monkey Row, I mean, with Tony, he's like, as long as you say hi or shoot me a text or invite me, like, I'm going to respond. You know, so early on, I was like, hi, my name's Jen. You want to come to this pool party <laughs> that a bunch of us are at? And he showed up. And so I think that was really cool to break those barriers early to be able to create true and real connections with people within your organization, which then become lifetime friends. I actually left uh, two years in and went to Australia and helped to start up out there, sat down with Tony, said, sorry, I'm leaving. And um, the head of merchandising, because I was a buyer there, he's like, listen, I left Nordstrom's to do this thing. The next day I was like at the trade shows, you know, at our old vendors. And uh, he left me a care package because he happened to be out there the month prior and just stayed friends. Um, and then I came back when DTP was really just kicking off. Uh, it helped my friend Megan Mosler start Stitch Factory, which is a fashion creative space in downtown Las Vegas. So I did that for a few years. And about two years ago, I was kind of, all right, wanting to branch off more kind of on my own or figure out what that really meant. Naturally sat down with Tony to, as a mentor, as a friend, as someone that I respect to kind of talk through that. And he's like, what about Ferguson's? I was like, all right, let me think about that. Uh, put together a presentation of what I thought a city block could look like, what it could do for the community, uh, how we could change the landscaping of downtown and the energy and kind of really just aligned on the same vision. And I mean, he can tell you what he saw in me and why I'm here, but uh, I think just that passion and that relationship and essentially at that point, seven years or eight years of uh, showing work and passion. It all started with an amazing deck. She built an amazing PowerPoint that uh, I remember seeing and going, yeah, <laughs> I definitely want to see that happen downtown. And that was how many years ago? Two, a little over two. November of, so two and a couple of months. As you can tell, we don't really pay attention to time. <laughs> We're like, we think it was six years ago, maybe two, but you know, two-ish. <laughs> I'm curious, have you, have you seen any other companies, brands do anything like you're doing with Zappos or the Ferguson Project or Downtown Project? I mean, is there anybody else that's maybe a startup or mid-scale right now that you've been impressed with that you've seen or have come talk to you to kind of pick your brain because they want to potentially model off your philosophy. So which, sorry, which parts when you say like? I'm just wondering if there's anybody else doing anything like you right now. But in terms of like? Just how you've actually set up the, the organization for Zappos. Uh, I don't think there's, 
I haven't come across any that are uh, our size. Um, yeah. And the way we're setting it up is with the CFO tool, each uh, circle or team has its own PNL, and they, you know, what used to be their equivalent of a manager or parent circle, uh, we basically flipped it, and so that is now your primary customer. And if you want more headcount or more budget, then go find more customers, and we don't really care uh, what you do as long as it falls within that triangle of accountability. Um, and so... I don't know of any other companies of our size that are kind of taking that approach. Normally, I think most companies are, here's the kind of top-down strategic plan, and now everyone kind of break that down into subcomponents and execute on it. Whereas the way I'm thinking about our future is, uh, uh, right now we have 300 circles, and just imagine Zappos is a circle printing factory, and... We take people that get recruited in Zappos, give them the uh, right training and coaching and so on so that they can either join an existing circle or start their own circle and do that intersection between you know, what they're passionate about, what they're good at, and uh, what uh, balances the, their, their own individual P&L. I'd say a lot of the inspiration that we get comes from books, <laughs> you know, uh, there's a really great book called Reinventing Organizations by Fr uh, Frederick Willow, who's, um, I hope I said that right. Uh, and that's, a, that's an amazing book that talks about all these things kind of in theories. And there is also a lot of examples of it working on small scale businesses. I think a lot of businesses start out very self-organized and very entrepreneurial, of course, right, as startups. But as they get bigger and bigger, like you said, that bureaucracy naturally sneaks in. One thing I love about what I've seen change at Zappos is in the past, because um, I've experienced both sides of Zappos, because Zappos was a hierarchy, but it was also, I felt like, a really positive experience because we did have really great managers and directors, but it's just hard for it to work right. Um, is in the past it would be it would only take one no to shut down a project mm -hmm. and now when you have all of these circles out there that have budget to spend within the system all it takes is one yes it just takes one believer in your idea and there's nothing stopping you from from charging for it and trying it out and uh, a really kind of fun example of that that happened at Zappos was for the longest time we weren't dog friendly so that we couldn't bring our dogs to work. You talk about bringing your whole self to work. Every time I leave my dog at home, it makes me sad because uh, she looks at me with those little puppy eyes and knows how to manipulate. But um, once we switched to self-organization, um, there really wasn't any, I guess, dominating force that could say, yes, you can or no, you can't. So we just started well, bringing our dogs to work until the company organized around that and created a system in which we... Um, we make sure the people with allergies and fears are taken care of, and that's the people who built the actual policies around it. So um, that's, a, a, I guess, a simple uh, positive thing, but it's something that in the past got shut down by bureaucracy, mm -hmm. and now there was no bureaucracy in place to I, stop I, it. I know yes is sometimes the hardest answer. Um, I have to run, but... It. Yeah, let me, let me, what's, I just, ha this is crazy because I, I literally just had a conversation with who I would perceive to be my mentor. And my mentor used to say, what brought us back together, I, I worked for him 15 years ago, so it was like 14 layers between him and me. So it was like, I was 23 year old, I had hair, all the good, oh, good old days. And um, we get on the phone, I was telling him what I was doing with the Courage platform, and he said to me, I, th this is back then, uh, the two most underutilized words in business are courage and no. And a year later, the conversation we just had is the two most underutilized words in business are courage and yes. And having the courage to say yes. And all it says is like, because people are so afraid. And it goes back to curiosity. Like, curi like you have the curiosity to say yes. And like, okay, let's just see where this thing goes. One of the part, because we're running out of time here. So I always bring gifts everywhere I go, but like one of the gifts I have, I despise fake it till you make it. It's like the only thing I really despise. Um, so what I like is mistake it till you make it. I like mistake. It's, now, I, I'm not going to be able to compete with your uh, Backstreet Boys t-shirt, but, but if you look right there, 
And I think I only have one size. I have a mistake until you make a T-shirt for you guys. And then, um, Tyler, you know this, but I really, yeah, he's like, where is it? There's too many gifts over there. I've got socks. So, so, so the idea for me, just, and Tony, I don't think you know this, and this isn't about me. And Jen, Jen is getting the mistake until you make it <laughs> T-shirt. Um, so the whole idea is I felt like a fifth-year senior in my own company, which is why I had the courage to leave and start Sock Problems, which are the socks. So it, today is actually World Autism Awareness Day. So although you're, you're rocking now the sock breast cancer socks, I, I brought autism awareness socks for you. I know we love animals. There's not a llama or an alpaca on there, but that's sock extinction. So these are for you. And you have no idea how grateful I am that you gave me your time. And um, I'm sure I speak for so many people when I say we're inspired by what you're doing. It's not BS. It's like legitimately... Like, you did it. You're very deliberate with what the decisions that you're making, and that's how I'm trying to live my life, too. I say courage is regret insurance. Like, I'm going to take a cut at it. If I fail, so what? Like, I'll learn from it. And you're like, Jen, you're right in the middle of it now. Yep, yep. <laughs> Not afraid to make mistakes, so it's the only way we can learn and figure things out, so. Any fi like final parting words that you want to share with us? Well, I like <laughs> something that Tony says, uh, which is a lot of people – say something's a failure and really I love that term mistake it till you make it because um, I was a musician prior to coming to Zappos and I learned to play the drums and the guitar but every time I'd mess up a note as I was practicing I didn't consider that a failure it may be a mistake yeah mm -hmm. um, but you learn and you progress until you master it and so the same thing in business I don't really like the term failure because I think people overuse it and you actually didn't fail you you were practicing at something and you might have been experimenting but um that's what I adhere to something I actually heard Tony say once so hopefully I didn't steal his final word <laughs> <laughs> and uh I was gonna say uh what Jen likes to say <laughs> is check out fergusonsdowntown.com. <laughs> the shameless title. plug. No, we're not, no, no, no. We've had, like, we had the best conversation. We're not ending on a, on a call to action, okay? Like, come on, give me, give me something, something good and juicy. Uh, sorry, I, I missed, the, I was so enthralled with Tyler's explanation, I forgot the original question. Like, I think a fi you asked Just for give a me final like, statement. Yeah, some something. final parting words, like on whether it's courage or curiosity or what you're trying to do next? Um, well, I can just say, like, the uh, mindset shift that we're undergoing at Zappos, I, I think, applies far beyond Zappos. And uh, it's really this idea, you know, kind of along what Tyler's was saying, but really, uh, if you just think of, frame everything as an experiment, and as long as you learn from the experiment, then uh, you're going to be that much uh, closer to figuring out how, I don't know, figuring out something magical. Jen? What She's nudging Jen Tony out, out of the way. Get out of here. Um, I mean, I think being around in the, uh, since for a while now, in the kind of like startup mentality and with a lot of entrepreneurs, I think for courage is to, one, no, you're not alone. Two, it's okay that you don't know everything. Um, and it's really okay to have mistakes. That's the only way that you can learn and grow. And then like, okay, that didn't work out so well how I had planned. So what did and what didn't and, and make those changes. Uh, I think there's an over overwhelming feeling that you need to know every answer and know what's going on at all times, which then creates a lot of uh, emotional breakdowns or discouragement or whatever. So I think remember to breathe and <laughs> we are all human and uh, there's a lot that each other have to offer to each other. So just uh, ask the questions and reach out to people and it's okay. You don't know the answers. So Tony, Tyler, Jen, thanks for joining us and don't forget to go to the website, of course, which is... <laughs> fergusonsdowntown.com <laughs> and, and maybe zappos.com yeah, too if you zappos, want to buy I some guess. shoes and stuff <laughs> and, and Zappo, zappos for good I want to talk about that at another time we'll, we'll come back to that yeah let's get together again thanks for having us yeah, thanks, thanks guys take care thanks. next week on the Courageous Podcast we are joined by Chief Marketing Officer of Surfro, Mike Stahl if you enjoyed the episode please give us five stars subscribe and leave us a comment <laughs>